Um, welcome to today's Postgres conference webinar, Reducing Costs and Improving Performance with Data Modeling in Postgres. I'm here with Charlie Batista, PostgreSQL Tech Lead at Percona, who's going to discuss how Postgres organizes data internally, how the free space map works, and how we can reorganize the data model to take advantage of data alignment inside blocks. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. So Charlie is passionate about new cultures, their languages and traditions, and until recently has lived in China. He's been working with databases and development for more than 12 years, and has participated in small and large projects across Brazil, the US, China, and other countries. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Charlie. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Well, as you done of introduction, I think I don't need this, this slide here anymore. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to have a brief overview on the underlying hardware, and then we're going to go for the Postgres itself, how it stores data, and the free space map to understand everything, how it's related to the cost that we have on, on the database. All right, so what is this talk about? Uh, we are here not uh, to talk about modeling the data itself. So we're not uh, talking about how to create and why we need to create primary keys or foreign keys. Uh, I believe we know that it's important. Uh, the idea for this talk is to understand internally how Postgres uh, internally organizes the data and how we can make usage of this understanding to make the better of the database. And uh, we are going to see how those organization apps on the underlying uh, storage system. So we're going to see through the file system, through the system, how the data is being organized. And the aim is that by the end of this talk, we have an overview and we understand how the, the blocks uh, work is inside the, of the, the, the the file, what is the type of organization for the file that Postgres will use. And then we can better choose what the types of the data that we're using for our tables and even organizing the, the position that we have for those fields inside of the table, uh, we'll see that they play a lot of impact on the table. All right, let's start then. So the first thing we I want to talk today is about the memory architecture. So this is just an overview of the modern memory architecture. And one thing that you want you to, to pay attention is that we have basically four types of memory when we're talking about a, a any server. So we we go for the one that it's pretty fast and very expensive that are the register to the last one that is pretty slow, but very cheap and usually pretty large that are the magnetic disks. So uh, the register, they're really inside of the CPU. They are very small space that we, we the CPU use to work with, with the data. And they're really, really fast and very expensive. And that's why we have just a few number of registers when we go for inside of CPU. The next one is the cache memory. So this is the, the, the first one that's outside of the CPU, but it's very close to the CPU and it's, it's very fast. So usually when you're gonna buy a computer, for example, a laptop, where we, you look at the CPU to choose a laptop, we're gonna see, okay, what is the, the, the speed of the CPU? Uh, how, does, how many gigahertz, megahertz the CPU, the clock works? And then we, we're gonna take a look on the cache memory. Because the more cache memory the CPU has, uh, the faster CPU can, can work. Because from the mem memory architecture, CPU cannot work data when the data is on the disk. The CPU needs to work with the data when the data is in register. And data in, in register, they can be cached to be accessed pretty quickly, pretty fast. And the first cached area that we use is the cache memory. It's a memory, it's a diff, it's not the same type of components as we have on the main memory, but they are very similar. The cache memory is use a much more expensive uh, components that we, we have on the main memory. Uh, 
So then we have the primary memory, that's the main memory, is the, the RAM, when we talk about computers, and we ask, okay, how much memory your server has? We're talking about main memory, the, the RAM. So it's getting much cheaper than 10, 15 years ago, but it's still much more expensive than we have on the, the fourth type that were the, the magnetic disk. And nowadays it's very common as well, the SSDs. And we'll see that those play, uh, how they, they, they play together here. And keep in mind that the CPU is not able to have direct access to the fourth one. CPU only has physical and direct access to cache memory and to the main memory. Every time the database needs to do something, it needs to ask for the IO subsystem to get the data from SSD or for, for the hard disk. Copy that data inside of the primary memory, the main memory, and then the CPU is able to work. And this is important to, to understand. So the memory, it can be divided in volatile or non-volatile. So a volatile, as the name says, it, it doesn't hold the data between restarts or when we have a power loss, for example. This is the, the RAM memory. The RAM and the, the cache memories, they're all volatile. So when we restart the computer, everything that in, is in memory is in RAM is just lost. So it's usually pretty fast and very expensive. Uh, and the opposite, the secondary memory that are the hard drivers, they are non-volatile. They're much uh, larger and cheaper than the, the primary memory, but they, they are usually very slow. And as I said, CPU has no direct access to secondary memory. CPU cannot directly access the, the hard drive. So when we go to memory access, we have basically three methods. We can have a random access method, sequential access method, and those are the two ones that we're interested here. And the third one, just for reference, we have direct access, um, usually use it when we use with tape and those uh, sequential drivers, but we are not interested on them. They, they do not play along with the, what I'm gonna talk here. Uh, sequential access, they're usually much faster. So for many reasons, uh, on the, the spinning disk, the old hard drive of the spinning disk, the main reason why sequential access was so much faster than random access is because the spinning disk, they have a moving part or moving parts, I would say. And the one that is the, the slowest one is the head. Every time that we, we, we have the spinning disk and the head needs to move to a new position, it's pretty slow because it's uh, use a synchronous motor to do this, this movement. So it's, it's a very slow movement. And this is why it makes random access so expensive and so slow. Because when the data is random distributed along the disk, uh, it means that the head needs to move uh, forward and forward uh, many, many times and make the access so much slow on the spinning disk on the hard drivers. When we have the data on sequential access, it's usually the head just need to, to go to initial point and then let the plate keep moving and then it's just read the data along. So it's, it's much faster. When we go for SSDs, of course, we don't have those problems. We, we don't have those moving parts, but we still uh, have uh, all the things that play along. That one that we're gonna he, uh, see here that we call uh, locality. locality uh, plays a big hole on, on when we're reading data. And we can see it clearly on SSDs, for example. So data locality is uh, the concept when we have one data next to the other. Uh, let's go back here. For example, let's say I have a file stored on the block number two of my disk. So the data locality says that the possibility that we need the next block when we're accessing the block number two is pretty high. So the disk can just prefetch, preload in advance this data inside of the memory. And it speeds up the, the performance of the system. So this is one of the, the reasons why when we have sequential access is still faster on SSD compared with random access, because the SSD can just do prefetch of the data pretty easily. Uh, modern NVMe solutions, they are improving because they, they can read 
uh, bake that multiple times. So, and then you can have just uh, one piece of hard or software organizing how all the data is, is, is written and you improve the concurrency. So even when you have random access and you cannot just prefetch the next one as because you have many, many uh, uh, process reading the same data at the same, same time, you can also improve the performance to be a little bit similar to sequential access. So that's why on SSDs, the difference is not so large as we have on hard drivers. So another con concept of locality, as we see here, is uh, spatial uh, time locality. So when we have temporal locality, it means that the data that I just accessed now, the chance that I need to access this data again in the future is pretty high. So for example, uh, I do, I have my system, I'm selling products on the internet. So a user just goes and check if I have one book. So the chance that that very same book being searched in the future is much higher than another book to be searched in the future. So if I can keep that data in memory longer, I can speed up the performance. This is the temporal locality. So I just keep the same information in cache or in memory for more time. So I can just speed up the performance of my database. Both those both concepts, they're pre use it on storage designs, especially when we, we have caches. So we take advantage of temporal locality and spatial locality. So we can design our system that we can put the data together one next to each other. So we can take advantage of the special locality and to do prefetch or pre-reads when we are reading the data. And we can also have is a larger cache or larger buffers to keep the data that we're working on on the on the main memory for, for more time. So on this way, our design can improve the performance when we are working on the database using those two concepts of locality. And here is just a comparison when we have a hard drive. And in this example here, we have a block of eight kilobytes. And we are reading, accessing a one, one K blocks, 1,000 blocks. So when doing random access on a hard driver, uh, it took 6.1 seconds. So the same access, the same data, when we do a sequential access for the same one kilobyte, 1,000 blocks, we have 53.1 uh, milliseconds. So look that we have orders of magnitude on the, the, the access time. And uh, comparison when we have S SSDs, we're gonna see here that the difference is much smaller. So it's almost double of the time. So when we do random access for the same 1000 blocks of eight kilobyte, kilobyte blocks, it took 4.17 milliseconds. And when it's sequential, it took uh, just 2.35 milliseconds. The difference is not as huge if we compare with spinning disks but it's still almost two times uh, as the performance. So still when using SSDs and MVE driver, solid driver, keep sequential access is still much faster than when you do a random access for, for the same amount of the data. And one thing that I, I forgot to mention here is when we're uh, talking about data access, we need to keep in mind that when we're accessing data from the hard drive or from the disk, we cannot access a one single byte. Every time that we access data, we just we need to read at least one block. So, and the block size, it varies, it changes from system to system and some, even some device, they have different block size. We need to check the, the, the manufacturer to see what is the block, block size. But the most common block size we have in the market is of uh, four kilobytes. So keep in mind that when you ask for your database, you do a select and select name from table user. So, and the name is pretty small. Let's say we, we have, uh, a few bytes for that name, right? So the database still needs to go and to underline in storage and read the whole block. So the whole block will be, will be put from the disk inside of the memory. And understanding this concept is very important because we can keep 
the data aligned with the block size. So if the system, in our case, a database, use a, a information in that is aligned it is the sizes uh, the same size as the, the, the underlying block size or a multiple of the, the the size for example let's say the storage has eight kilobytes block size we use 16 kilobytes block size we're still aligned right because our block size is the size of two blocks of the the underlying system so it makes everything works much faster because if we don't work on this way, when we save one, one data, for example, we can just waste uh, space inside of the, the file system. Let's say the file system has a four kilobytes block size. If we, inside of our database, we design the database to work with five kilobytes block size. When we send the data to the file system, it is not able to use only one block. It uses two blocks, but one block when I store four kilobytes, and another block one only one kilobyte. Uh, one kilobyte. So we are wasting for every time that we save data from the database to the file system, we are wasting three kilo, uh, kilobytes on this example here, and that's why it's so important to to have them aligned, the database and the file system aligned with the the, the block size. All right, now that we have a basic understanding how those things work, how the file system works with the underlying, uh, or the database works with the underlying file system, uh, let's dig in inside of the, the, the Postgres. Uh, the Postgres use uh, one type of file that we call heap file. This is what, one of the simplest form of file organization. So it's organized in blocks. Uh, as we expect. So inside of the file, we have many blocks. Every block is defined for eight kilobytes uh, as the full on Postgres. We'll see later that we can, can change, but it's not that fast. So the heap file is organized in blocks. So, and it doesn't keep any order from the information. So it's just an, one unordered set of records stored inside of each page. So because it doesn't keep any order, it's always try to insert by the end of each page when we do insert. And it's very efficient. The insertion on Postgres is very efficient because it doesn't need to, to reorganize and to do any reorganization of the file. Just for comparison, another very common uh, file uh, solution that we have for the database is what we call cluster files or cluster index. When using cluster files, the file is organized as a B3 normally. So it's organized uh, as a tree inside of the file. And every time that we insert something, we need to make sure we keep the order inside of the file. That's why it's more costly uh, to insert data when we are using a tree uh, uh, structure like we, we do for <clears throat> other types of organization. But the heap file is just a bunch of data. We just have a bunch of, of pages one after the other. So uh, another concept that we have, uh, especially when we're working with database, is that we don't have real deletion on the database. When we do a delete, the, that row is not really removed from the database. On Postgres and on heap files, especially on Postgres, they're marked for deletion. So eventually that, that space is going to be reclined, going to be cleaned, and we'll be able to use again. But it's not instantly removed from, from the data file. As the same way, when you have an update, an update is basically a deletion followed by an, uh, an insert. So it marks the old row as removed and insert the updated data, the new data in the end of the file. So uh, when we do a delete or we do an update, we always leave those obsolete data in the vacuum is so important because when we do the deletion, we need to, to be able to clean up this that information, the, let the database reuse the information. 
that's why it's so important when we have a vacuum process planning. And it's so important that we do not disable the out vacuum on Postgres. Sometimes we, we find problems, the out vacuum is not coping with the data, the amount of the data. So we need to proper address and optimize the out vacuum process instead of disable. I've seen a lot of companies, a lot of, of GPAs that just go in there and disable the out vacuum. It's super, super dangerous and can bring a lot of problems. So try to never ever disable the out vacuum on in production database. Okay, heap files inside of Postgres. So as you said, Postgres use heap file. So it does use the heap files to store data for all the tables. All the tables are a heap files by essence in Postgres. So each heap file has a limit of one gigabyte. It doesn't mean that the table has a limit of one gigabyte, but the heap file itself. So if the table grows uh, over one gigabyte, we just have more and more heap files, but one each of them of a limit of eight gigabytes. The pages inside of heap files on Postgres, they are of eight kilobytes. So this is the default value. We can change the default value, but we cannot change uh, on runtime. It's not a configuration parameter that we change and then change the, the, the file. We actually need to recompile the database if we want to change the, the, the size of the file. And it's usually not advisable. There are some circumstances that we, we can improve performance, uh, but most of the case is not advisable. If we try to, to change the heap file for whatever reason, make sure you do really understand the reasoning why you are changing and the consequences and do a lot of tests because that, that can bring a lot of problems. Uh, in the table, all the pages there logically equivalent. It means that the data can be stored in any page. So as we inserting and updating and moving the, the data inside of the, the, the tables, inside of the balls, it can be stored in any page. We are going to have a, I'm going to show you a, a quick presentation, quick demo later. And I actually, I've saved a lot uh, I was planning to do a lot more here, and I've just been saved all the, the presentation, like the, the test that I've done here. Uh, I, I saved some comments here. Uh, uh, it's all on my GitHub. I will put the, the link on my GitHub, so we won't have time to go through all, everything this here. I just separated a couple of examples that we, 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 we're going to have during the presentation today. But the files, they, they will be saved on, on my GitHub page. So you can download, you can go and you will see the comments of what everything is done. Okay, moving on. Uh, the page layout. So this is when the things start getting interesting inside of Postgres. Uh, as we know, the hip files, they're divided in page. And each of those pages, they are very specific layout. Those are the place that we really save the data, where the data is stored. They're stored on those pages. By the full, uh, the page size on Postgres is of eight kilobytes. We have a header here in the beginning of the page that has all holds all the information for that very specific page, uh, like page size. I mean, page size, page number, and. <clears throat> if we have free space inside of the page. So we have a lot of information on the header. And then we have a, some pointers. Those, what we call here, those item data, they just pointers to the data itself. They are not the data. And by the end of the table is where we start to, to have the data inside of those pages here. Uh, we have in the very end this, this special area here, this, it's not important for our talk. It's just a, an area that holds information about indexes and they are uh, uh, most usually on the indexes files. So, and for our discussion here, uh, we don't really, really care about what is being stored in this special area, but we're not going to use. But right after that is where we start storing the data. And the Postgres, it is, the data is stored from the end of the page and grows towards the center. So, and those pointers, they move, they grow toward the center as well. And we might 
ask the data that are stored in the same place, right? Because they're stored in the, in the same page. So why do we need those pointers here? And it might be weird. And actually it's a pretty interesting design. And one of the, the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons is what we call the heap only tuple updates or hot updates that sometimes we hear uh, people asking if our database does more or less hot updates. Uh, what happens is when we create a table, let's create, a, let's say create the table user. So on, from the table user, I have a couple of indexes, right? I have a primary key and I might want to have an index on the username. So I have a couple of indexes and every time that I insert data here, the index needs to be updated. So when I update the data here, the index also needs to be updated because remember, uh, the Postgres doesn't do an in-place update. Let's say I update this very last tuple here. What Postgres does is marks this tuple as removed, copy the data and save that data data somewhere else. And for example, let's say it updates just this here is with the, the new data. So, what be, just because we have indexes for this table here, the indexes needs also needs to be updated with the new location of this data, right? Well, with the heap only tuple, if the change that we do happens in, inside of the same page, let's say we have a space here inside of this very same page to put the data, the, in, the index doesn't need to be updated because the index, it points to those pointers here of, of inside of the page. We can just update the new position inside of the pointer here to point to the new data. And we can save a lot of IO uh, because you don't need to update the indexes anymore. And that's why one of the reasons that we, we have this design inside of, of the page inside of Postgres. So if we have enough space inside of the page, when we do an update, we can do a heap only update. So it's only updated here on the heap page, on the heap file. And it saves a lot of IO. So it makes everything way more performatic, more, uh, way faster. And this is one of the reasons. And well, the, the tuple, they also have a, a design, so a layout. And this is the layout of the tuple. We also have a header. Uh, there are a lot of interesting information on the header, uh, but for this discussion, we're interested basically in two informations. This is what the, we call the T-HOF. This is the offset on where the data really starts because the data doesn't really start all the same place of the same position inside of the, uh, of the tuple here. Uh, and this happens because the way that Postgres uh, works uh, with new data. So when we have a table, let's say I create a table user, have, yeah, as I was explaining here, uh, we have the this bitmap for null data on, on Postgres. So what Postgres does is for every row that can be null, it has one bit here that represents represents if that, that column is no or not inside of the fold. So we can save a lot of space uh, when we're working with a large table that they can have a lot of nulls data for, for, for example. But because of that, uh, the header cannot be of the fixed size. So we cannot just have a 24 bytes header. Because if we have a really large table, we might need more than uh, one byte to represent all the, the columns that we have inside of the table. So, and because the header cannot be of fixed size, we need to have uh, information where the data really starts. And this is how we can see here. Uh, remember I said, I, I just, uh, prepared a, some, some examples. So I have a database here that I created, name test of database. And for this example only, remember, 
only for this example, I'm disable out vacuum. Again, never they does do it in production, please. Uh, it's very dangerous, but I don't want the auto vacuum to play along when we're doing the presentations or uh, I'm going to delete some data. So I want it to, the, the, the space to be there just to make sure that auto vacuum is disabled. I'm also using three extensions here that, to, that helps to inspect inside of the data. One uh, is PG free space map. So when we start talking about free space map, uh, it's very useful to inspect the data. Uh, page, uh, page inspect is the one that I'm going to use for the most. So it show us information about the page itself inside of, of the Postgres. And for the visibility map, we have another one uh, named PG visibility. So again, for the file that I've saved, and uh, I have comments on all the, the, the examples that we, 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 we must run. So, but for now, I've created this table I just named TQ item. So it's a very simple table. It only has a couple of, of rows and uh, one item type, it's integer of two bytes. Uh, we have the ID of the queue itself because we can have more than uh, one queue. And so this is the ID of the, 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 the parent table, the queue. We show if the, this item in the queue is active or not. Uh, the idea of the item itself is the idea of this table, it's of integer eight, and the, the value that it holds and the parent because they, the item can have some parent in this example here. As you see, I don't have any index, so we shouldn't bother for now about the index. Uh, it's just a very simple table with no index uh, at all here. And I've populated with one million rows. So if I do here a select count start from this table. So, oops, we're gonna see that we have here 1 million rows. So it's been populated already. And, okay, this is the size of the table that we have in disk. It has 73 megabytes, that's all fine, all good. And what I want to show here, and it's, it's related to what we have there, is that we can get information from the, the table itself. So I'm getting here the items inside of the page number zero. This, this table has a lot of pages because they have one million rows. I just, I'm just interested in, in the, the first ones, the, the, the first uh, data. So we have the header and we have a lot of information. So if I do here, if I do run this one, you'll see here that we have way more information than I collected. And we have the data itself. So it's in a, in a, it's a binary representation. It's a, in X decimal for, for the data that we have inside of the page. And we have the header, we have information about where the, the, the data starts. And here, this line pointer here is, let's go back, is just this guy. Is the pointer that we have for even of those, those items here, what are what we call the liner pointers. So they will point to, to the place where the data is and inside of the, the data, we can also get uh, where the, the actual data starts from, from that page. And here is the size of the data inside that we have. So in this very example here, line point of one, the data gonna start at this position inside of the page and gonna hold 72 bytes. So this is the size of my data uh, ID one. And actually we can do a select start from TQ item limit one. So this is my data. I have an uh, item type, a KID. So this is what is a, the representation inside of the table for this data on, on that we have here. Okay, moving on. Uh, one thing that I before talk about post that I want to, to explain here and we go back to, to the 
to, to, to the database is about data alignment. And this is probably the most important thing that you, you take from this, this talk. Inside of the database, uh, Postgres tries to keep the, the data, the size of, of each data or each field aligned with the world on the CPU. So to be able to efficiently work, uh, the CPU is always try to work with the data of the same size that we call word size. And if we can save the data, if you can save the information or work with the information inside of the database with the same word size that the CPU works, we can make it really fast, really efficient. And most of the CPUs, the more detectors, the word size is, is of eight bytes. And Postgres has an internal natural alignment between each column inside of the table that tries to keep them aligned with eight bytes. So what does that mean? Let's come back here to, to my example. Let's make it a bit more room here. So in my table, I created here, the first uh, column is integer of two bytes. So this data holds two bytes. Two bytes is way uh, is smaller than the eight bytes aligned that we have, right? So it's initially is not a problem. The problem is the next row that I have here is of eight bytes. So if I sum up those two plus eight, of course, gonna be larger than the, the data world, the eight bytes. So I cannot grab those two rows together to send to the CPU to work, so I put it in this way. I need to send this data, and then I need to send this data in another CPU cycle, let's put it in this way. So, but to make it work properly, internally, Postgres will do what we call padding. It will just add eight more, uh, six more bytes here to make it aligned with the, the word size. So we're gonna waste one, two, three, four, five, six bytes inside of this table, just because we it's not proper aligned. So if I had, for example, another one that was type of two bytes, and let's say another column here that is type of four bytes. So that's fine because as four bytes only needs a, a, an extra four bytes for alignment. So it could send those together and we have a eight bytes alignment uh, with this, this data here. And how can we see that? So Postgres actually give us the ability to check this, the, this information. Remember here, uh, this select here, if I run, so I can get, let me make a bit more room here. I got the position of the, the data that I, I have inside of the page, right? So this is the position that I have inside of the page. I can use some OS tools. For example, I can use here the X dump to just grab, go there inside of this, this, this file and check what we have. And let's do this now. So first of all, I need to know where is the, okay, this is the folder that my data is. The OID of my test database, okay, I have the OID. And the OID of my table. Let me just make sure I'm pointing here to the right place. Okay, base and OID, yeah, I'm pointing to the right, right place. So uh, let's go to, here is my, my data G, the data folder of my database. I of course have this file here, that is the table that we just created. So if I run this X dump command here, what we're gonna get is the hexadecimal representation of the data that we have inside of Postgres. So remember that the first 24 bytes in our case is the header of the item. So the last byte here from the, uh, for the header is 
the information of nodes. So this is the node bitmap. And the data starts here. And this one, I suppose, is the ID for our table. Let me just go back here. I have the select. OK. OK, this is the select I did. I just copy here. Let me copy and paste here to make it easier for us to open. So this is hexadecimal. I am horrible doing math uh, for X, com, uh, converting hexadecimal to decimal and this kind of stuff. What I'm going to do is just uh, using a calculator here. So my calculator, if I put 25 to hexadecimal and to the decimal, so this is the value that we have. So this is obviously the data. And if I, let's go for the not next, next one. So uh, because of the Indianness that Postgres use, so the organization of the data here, we're going to start with 10, 11. OK, but it is hexadecimal, actually. 10, 11, and it should be 4113. Yeah. So this is the next data. If we pay attention, look, those many zeros here, actually from here, those zeros were not supposed to be here because they're just waste of data. The Postgres are using this padding here to make possible for us to have a world size of the same, the same size of the CPU, to have an alignment when the data goes to the CPU. This next one is fine because here is an integer of eight bytes. So it's just the size of the, the information. But if we go for the next field here, it's, it's active, it's a Boolean one. A Boolean only, one hold, only holds one byte of information. And in our case, this here is true. So we are again wasting seven bytes here inside of, of this row. And only two rows, uh, we can say, well, that's not much, right? Uh, but for this table that we have here, for example, what if I reorganize the table? I'm going to do a uh, reorganization of the table I have here. Uh, down. OK, I created this table again. Look, I created a table what I named TQ item good, right? So I'm going to drop this one. Uh, and I'm going to create this table again. I use exactly the same uh, the same items that we have like in, in that, that other table. So they're exactly the same structure. The only thing that I did is I organized a little bit different. So I put all the eight bytes fields, all integer eight in the beginning, QIT, QITM ID, item find. Then I put the ones that are of Q4 bytes together. And the last one is a decimal. The thing is about types like decimal and numeric and varka is the database doesn't really know how much data they can hold because, well, they're variable, right? So ooh, as when you use varka or decimal, we the size of the, 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 the data can vary because we, the user can just define the size at once. They don't have a predefined type. That's what I, I mean when I say the database doesn't really know the size. Of course it does, but it doesn't have a predefined size like an integer, a big integer, or an uh, integer of two bytes. So I just reorganized the data here. Let's create this data. And as I created as a, as a select from the original data, I have exactly the same data on both two tables. There's nothing different from one table to another. They hold exactly the same data. So I'm going to do a checkpoint to make sure I'm going to flush everything. Uh, I don't need to do a vacuum, but let's do a vacuum just in case uh, that I, what I'm going to do, I pick this vacuum full, because I want to make sure that uh, if I did any update, they won't interfere in the size of the table so that we really have the, 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 the original tables. And if I check both tables, the size, what an amazing surprise here. The table that we have those empty space holds 73 bytes, megabytes. 
The other table, just because I reorganized the columns in a different fashion, we have exactly the same columns, exact, columns exactly the same size. I just changed the order. Now it's 67 megabytes. It's almost 30% difference that we have used. It's 27, 25% uh, performance. And I mean, space saved inside of the database. And remember, from the beginning of the talk, everything that we hold inside of, of the database, if we need to, to work, it needs to go to memory. And the memory representation of the data is exactly the same. The CPU will copy the data from, uh, you ask the, the IO subsystem to copy the data from the disk and place in memory and then work with the data in memory. So we we'll also have all that, that waste space inside of the memory. And that is how we really get a, a, some improvement and we can also save a lot of costs. It's just one table and it's a pretty small table. So can you imagine when our tables start growing to terabytes of information, how much we can save by the end of the month when we need to, to prepare the bill for AWS, for example, when we have it there, or how much storage we save if we have it on premise. And again, it goes to memory, to CPU. So it's a lot of, uh, of storage and costs that we can save when we understand all those uh, data distribution inside of the database. Uh, yeah, I skipped here the, the toast. So now that, that we understand how it's saved, uh, one, another thing that we need to, to pay attention is the database Postgres it doesn't split the data between two pages. What does, what do I mean it doesn't split? Let's say I have a big text that has more than eight kilobytes uh, of sites in one, in one row. It's not able to save inside of, of the data page as we, hear, as we see here. So what it needs to do is it creates an, another file that it calls toast file. The representation is, is very similar. It also works in eight kilobytes page, but it creates, it saves that data inside of the post file externally. And here inside of the tuple, instead of the data is just create a pointer for the position of that, that data on the post file. So every time that we have huge data that are really huge and goes more than a, the full value that is of two kilobytes, this is what Postgres called too large of row. So a row that's by the full, larger than two kilobytes, it's stored elsewhere. It's not stored inside of the, the data file, but elsewhere on a toast file. So those also play, play a role when we need to, to, to save space. Because now, if we have, uh, data that can be really large. And if we can put that data by the end of the file, so the organization that, that Postgres does and the padding that needs to be done because you just have a reference can, can be avoided. So we can also use the same technique to, to save space. And well, yeah, we just saw uh, how data alignment and padding can play really a big, big uh, role here. So this is just the, the compilation of the example we just did. So for the same 1 million rows, uh, from one table to another table, we had really huge difference just because we, we changed the organization uh, of the, the columns inside of the table. So it can save a lot of space. And we are going to the end of the talk. The free space map is the last talk that we have. Yeah. So one thing, remember that when I said uh, that when we delete role or we update, we are not really deleting that role in place. So the database needs to go there, mark that role to be removed. And then when the auto vacuum or manner vacuum pass by, it's going to freeze up that space inside of our data file. The Postgres needs to have a mechanism to keep track of that data. And the mechanism is what we call free space map. So the free space map, as the name says, is a, is a map. 
So it works in a very similar to a tree, in a very fashionable way to a tree. It tracks all the empty space that we have inside of each page. So as we can see here in this diagram, so in the very end, we have the page number. And then the next row here is how much empty space, how much free space we have for each row. But here, the number, like for the number two, it doesn't mean that we have two bytes or two kilobytes of data, uh, the free data. It means that we, we have two unities of empty data inside uh, of this, this page. But what does that mean? Uh, to keep it small, to keep the free space map small and performant, uh, we, uh, the database, only use one byte per node. So only one byte to storage and represent all the information that we have inside of that page. So if the, each page has eight kilobytes size, it's not possible to represent eight kilobytes using one byte, right? So what Postgres does, it gets the page size uh, by the full that is eight kilobytes and divide by the byte size. So the byte holds 265, uh, can hold up to 265 of information, right? So, and each unity represents the, the result of this division. In this example here, uh, each unity represents 32 bytes. So if this page, page number zero, number one here has two units free, it means it has 64 bytes free. So, and the, the representation here on each subtree, it represents the largest number of bytes that can, can be found here under the subtree. For example, here, the largest one is two. We can clearly see, we have the page number zero, it holds zero units and the page number one holds two. If we go up, we have eight, max of eight units here in this whole subtree. And it's on the page number three. So it will help the database to navigate when it needs to, to find uh, available space inside of each page. And that's what we're gonna see in this example here. Let's say we want to find a page that has at least four available slots in the vicinity of page number four. Pay close attention to this vicinity here. Postgres and most of the database, we always try to keep a, a special locality, right? Locality on the position. So if we, if we are updating something inside of the page number four, it will always try to keep that same data inside of the page number four because we can use the hot update. If it's not possible, it will try to keep it closer because let's say we need to do a full table scan. As we need to do a full table scan, the, the more sequential we have the data, the better and it's gonna be faster. So we don't need to do random random reads or random access. And that's why it's always try to keep the, the, the data close to each other. So the question is, okay, let's find a four available slot on the vicinity of page four. So the database, we first find the page four. Okay, this is the page number four. The page number four can only hold up to two slots. So it's, it's not enough. Then we go to the to the tree up. Let's see in this sub tree here how many slots we have. Well, the max we have is three. Still not enough. We go to the next sub tree up. So in the next one we hold seven. So the maximum value here is the seven. As we are coming from the sub tree from the left, of course there is not on the left. We need to go to the right. Okay, and yeah, this one holds at seven as well. And if we go to the left here, we will just find one page, that's page number six in this example, that can hold four, those four slots. So this is how the free space map works. And because we only use um, one byte to represent the number, usually the free space map is really, really small uh, if you compare to the database file, to the file size. And Let's just try to see here if I have one. 
So I did dot star. Oh, uh, of course it changed it because I did a vacuum full and the vacuum full just changed the, the name of the file. So I need to get a new one. Oh, and the new one is, oh, sorry. Okay, this is the, okay, one five, one six five four two. And if we go here, we don't have any free space map here, right? But we can force. Let's go to delete from TQ item where QIT equals 17. Okay, so we did 16 and we if we just run a vacuum, we don't need a vacuum, we don't want a vacuum for here. And here, here we go. We have the free space map here. If we take a look, the size of the, 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 the file itself, the data file is 74 megabytes. The free space map is only 40 kilobytes. It's just a fraction of the size that we have. Because the way that they does the representation of the free space map, it's only used one byte for, for, to represent each of the pages. And it can save a lot of space. And it's very efficient, the, the, the way that it's searched. So that we, we come to the end. We are to the summary here. And what we saw today. So where today we saw that Postgres stores the data in heap files. Heap files is very simple form of organization. The heap file for Postgres is divided in blocks of eight kilobytes each. We saw that the data has no order at all. Even when we do uh, insertion, like we can, we can say, oh, it can have the insertion order, right? But if we think about when we do an update, it just changes the order because it doesn't update in place, it's marked the, 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 the item as, as deleted. When the vacuum comes and clean up, something else can be inserted on, on that space. So we cannot guarantee any order inside of the heap page. Uh, the Postgres controls the free space map you using uh, a tree structure that holds one byte for each block. So it's very, it's very efficient. Uh, deleting a record as we saw, it's not really removing, it's just mark and it's removed. And that update does the same. Uh, the Postgres uses the natural alignment of eight bytes internally. And this is probably the most important take that we need to, to from this talk, the, the natural alignment and how it does the padding and how that the padding it does can really cause bloat inside of the table and without reorganizing the table, we, we're not able to, to remove. But if we be careful when we are designing or modeling the database, we can just take it to minimal. So, and you can save a lot of space and we can save a lot of data. And also, well, you can find these slides and the scripts are here at my GitHub, as I said. And here are my contacts. Here is, you have my, my GitHub. And that's it. Thanks guys, uh, and we're open for questions if you have any. Hey Charlie, thank you, that was great. Um, so we have three questions here. Yep. Are there any real world systems that use a block side other than 8KB? Well, there are. Uh, MySQL, for example, if not mistaken, it's used block size of 16 kilobytes. And there, there are systems that they use block size of 64 kilobytes, for example. And it's not really a problem if designers use a block size uh, uh, as this large, as this big. 
uh, and the thing that take we need to, to have is we need alignment, right? So as the most common block size uh, of OS is of four kilobytes and the hardware is of four kilobytes. As long as you have alignment between the block size of, of the underlying subsystem and the, the database that we are we're working, so we are good to go. And if we understand, let's say uh, I have a system that I save a lot of images and different types of binary files, and they are pretty large. So if I can make the block size larger for this, my specific system, I may gain a lot of performance because especially for SSDs that can read a huge chunk of data at the same time, or even for, for hard driver, because we're gonna have the sequential read for that huge block size, we can speed up the performance a lot. But it's, again, we need to understand how our system works so, and we need to understand how the underlying subsystem works. So we, then we can make the, the right decision if, if we can go with more or, or larger block size as eight kilobytes, like for example, Postgres does. Wonderful. Question about spatial locality. Yep. How strong is spatial locality usually between different tuples on the same page, given that tuples can be stored on any page in a table? Do you know any benchmarks around this? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the tuples on the same page, uh, let's say, remember that when I said we, we well, the database doesn't read bytes from the disk, it's, it's really blocks, it will read the whole page. So if we're accessing uh, more than one row from the same page, so you just have, the, the best performance that you could because the database just get that the first send page put on memory, right? So it just need to, to do one run inside of the, 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 the disk. You don't need to, to do anything else. So you get everything that you need just from one ask from the disk and you put in memory. And also the CPU, when the CPU gonna get the information, it just get from one run from memory. So it's really fast. When the data is distributed along all, all the, the, the system, let's say in a random way, it will depend a lot on your IO subsystem. Let's say you are using SSDs. So in best case scenario, uh, you're gonna spend twice as time to get the data. And you also uh, can probably get a lot of, of junk data, data that you don't need, right? Uh, for example, let's say you have the table user and you want to select the user from ID 1 to 10. So if you have the ID 1 to 10 all in the same page, you only need one page. But if you, if you did a lot of updates and every ID is a different page, so because you have 10 different pages instead of get 8 kilobytes from the disk, now you're going to get 80 kilobytes from the disk, 8, 0. So it's going to be at least 10 times slower from the disk perspective uh, because you need to, to get all those 10 pages just because information is, is not on the same spot, on the same data. That's how special locality can be so influential when designing the, 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 the database, right? Because we can just split the data. You can need to go to the disk many, many times. And if you... Think about that everything goes to memory. So when you have everything on the same page, those 10 rows on the same page, you only put one page in memory. If you have the separated on 10 pages, because they are just not together, so now you have 10 pages in memory and you might not need the information for the other pages. You just might need one single row for or, or each page. So all the 90% of the data that you put in memory is useless, at least for now, for your database, right? So, and the impact can be huge. And benchmarks, uh, it's hard to, to, to talk about benchmarks uh, because uh, as I said, every system, they, 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 they might have a different behavior. So you, if your data is really sparse, it's sparsely distributed on the database, they're not together. So the, the performance degradation can be pretty huge. 
Beautiful. And the last question, um, why does Postgres not automatically reorder the columns for optimal alignment? Uh, because it's expensive. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's, it's a very expensive operation. Uh, if we, if we, you have small tables, let's say, uh, like this one, one, one million rows. So I might just need a couple of seconds, maybe milliseconds, especially if, if I have a good IO subsystem, right? So, but can you imagine that every time that you do an update on the table, it needs to get reorganized, realigned. It's very expensive. So uh, we are trying to, to get thousands or millions of operations per second, right? So if, Every time that I do an update, and if I have a thousand updates per second, I need to reorganize the table a thousand times per second. It's not doable, right? It's, it's for, for the OS perspective and the IO perspective, it's very expensive. And that's another reason that we, we have buffers and caches. And the OS, most of, of OS, Linux, uh, the one that I, I, I work with and I know, uh, you have the IO cache, IO buffer, for example, what the IO buffer it does. So it keeps all the data that's been updated in memory and it doesn't immediately flush to the disk. It will flush to the disk every second or so, it depends on the scheduler, but it, it just holds all the data that, that you, you update. And this is one way that the, we found to try to keep the data organized. So every time that you, you write to the database, instead of it just flush to the disk, the database is gonna hold that, that data in memory. So of course you, you, you have uh, your binary files and the data files that, that you save the, the change you did because we need to, to keep it, right? It's just for persistence. But the, the data files itself is not updated immediately. So, because the concept of temporal locality, if we hold that data that we just updated now, the chance that we update that data again is pretty high. So if we have a thousand updates on the same table, on the same second, so we can just hold those thousand updates in memory. And when we flush that data from memory to disk, we just do one flush. We can reorganize that data and we can save a lot of IO. And that's the reason why the, the database, not only Postgres, but all the database, they don't reorganize the data every time that you do an update or insert. It tries to keep the, the, to hold the data in memory. And then from time to time, just flush everything. So then it keeps the, the data locality as better as it can, right? Lovely. Thank you. Those are all of our questions. Okay, cool. Um, so Charlie, thank you so much. I know we had some technical difficulties, but you know, it was very worth it to stay on the line. Um, you're getting a ton of thank yous and good jobs in the chat. So on behalf of all of our attendees, thank you and great job. Well, yeah, I, I will say thank you all for, for the attendance. Thank you for the opportunity, of course. Uh, it, it was a, a pleasure to be here. Really, thank you. Brilliant. And to all of our attendees, thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. Um, I hope to see you all on future Postgres conference webinars and have a great rest of your day.